All right, so my name is Edwin. Today, we're going to be talking about protecting the childlike heart. And in this message, this is such an important message because as adults, we're trying to become more educated. We're trying to become more logical. We're trying to uh, keep up with the world. But Jesus says something different. He's talking about being childlike. And there's something just so interesting about the kingdom of heaven. It's always the opposite. And uh, I, I want to just share this story with you. My, my wife and I, when we travel and when we go in the car, oh, by the way, I'm married now. So I think last time I came here, I was a single man, but now I'm married. So I'm really happy just to be here as a married man. But uh, me and my wife, when we travel, uh, I would always just tease her and joke with her. I would always say, Priscilla, I think I'm the best. I, I think I'm the greatest person ever. And, and I was mentioned people like Leonardo da Vinci. And then she'd be like, you're comparing yourself to Leonardo da Vinci? Okay. Or I would say, like, what if I'm like Steve Jobs? What if I'm like Elon Musk? What if I'm like Steph Curry? I can make those threes. She doesn't believe that I have basketball skills because I shoot very awkwardly. But that's what I would joke with her. I was, I am great. And she would just roll her eyes at me. And, and she would just say, husband, it's okay, you know. <laughs> and, and I just began to wonder, like, that question. Am I great? Are you great? And then I, I, would, I would say that so often, even jokingly, I would, I would play video games with uh, Andrew Castillo right there. And we would play video games and I would beat him in Mario Party. I would beat him in Mario Kart and he will never admit it because he only has pictures of him beating me, but I beat him more often. And so I would always say after I beat him, oh, I think I'm the best. I think I'm the greatest. And uh, I just want to talk to you about that. Like, what does it take to be great? Does it mean that you have to be the most educated? Does it mean that you have to be uh, the most uh, philosophical, uh, the, most, uh, the person with the most uh, uh, logic sense, uh, yeah, that you have the most scientific facts? So let's go to Matthew 18. Would you join me here? So it says this, Matthew 18, 1 to 4. If you're there, say I. All right. All right, so at Matthew 18, it says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them, three, uh, uh, verse 3, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is the context of this uh, passage right here. Uh, Jesus is calling a child. Now, at this, is this, at this time, the children were low social power. They didn't have a lot of resources or money. Today, maybe a child can be a YouTuber. They're already an entrepreneur. They have investments. Parents would invest in them. At this time, they had nothing. So to use a child is saying, Jesus, really, that, that's not the greatest person ever. Uh, something interesting also is that uh, Jesus is calling a child to him, and the child will actually go to Jesus. And I just find that so fascinating because children often get scared, right? They don't just go to adults right away. And something else interesting is that the disciples are saying, who's the greatest? Like, what kind of question is that? That they're saying that uh, I'm greater than John, I'm greater than Peter. And it's such a prideful question. What if I went to Apostle Michael and said, hey, am I the greatest? Am I better than Fred? Am I better than uh, Charlotte? What a prideful question. Why would I ask such a question? But Jesus does not deny this question. Uh, even though the disciples, they already been around Jesus for a while. Uh, they've seen him heal. They've seen him do the deliverance. Uh, they've seen him walk on water. And they have the nerve to say, who is the greatest? I, just, I, I think that is just an interesting point that we need to point out. Because Jesus does not go against these questions. He actually embraces these hard questions of life. And I just want to encourage you that maybe for you, you have hard questions. That you have questions that are not answered. But it's okay to go to God and ask some of, the, ask some of these questions to him. Because he will freely answer you. And so Jesus says this. Well, 
whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He does not ignore this question. He embraces it. But in this world, we say that being an adult is being the greatest. Having the most education is the greatest. Having the title is the greatest. Just because you are not an apostle or a prophet does not make you the greatest. And I want to declare to you today that you are great, that you can do more for the kingdom of God, that you can prophesy, that you can pray. I heard about this one story where my professor in Bible college was saying uh, there was this man who was handicapped and he was bedridden, he couldn't move. Like literally, like he can't move his arms, he can't move his legs. Is that person great? But the professor said this, this person can pray. And how many of you know that prayer changes things? <sighs> yeah, so when, uh, you know, so I'm having this thought of just this Bible verse, and I'm thinking like, okay, God, this is, this is what it takes to be great. I need to become like a child. And my whole life, I remember thinking, even at the age of six, seven, and eight, my parents were telling me to become more educated. Uh, I have to go to UC Berkeley. I have to become a doctor. And I was always thinking about who I'm going to marry. And I remember just even being as a teenager, I was always thinking about being an adult. I need to be older. I need to, I need to learn more. I need to get more knowledge. I mean, isn't that us today that we're always just trying to acquire more? I mean, even in the, uh, God's word, we're always trying to just learn more about the Bible, the text. Instead of being positioned as a child and knowing that you are a son and daughter of the king. And so I, I began to just go on this journey with God. And I remember that I started off being a teacher. My pastor said, Edwin, you, could, you should try to be a teacher. Push that aside. You're just saying that because, you know, I, I just, I do worship, but I don't think I could teach kids. So I began to teach, and I love children's ministry. Children's ministry was one of my favorite times of my life where I just began to teach kids. I began to just teach them the Bible, and soon after, I became a teacher. Now, this is the thing. I began this journey as a teacher, and this is something interesting. Sometimes in life, when, you're, when you have a career with the Lord, it's not about your career. It's about what he wants to teach you during your career. So I would be on the playground, and there would be a, I would just be doing yard duty, and the children are playing. I would just watch them. Now I'm an adult. Right now, I'm 23 years old. I'm a teacher. I got an education under my belt, and I watched them. And I would just have a triggering effect. I would get an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord would just remind me that as I am watching them, the Lord watches over me. How many know that the Lord watches over you? Uh, another time is when I'm just teaching in a classroom with my, uh, my whiteboard, and I would just be teaching, and I, I would just be reminded of the fact that I'm in the school of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus is the great teacher. I mean, there's also tragic times, too, where I'll be on the playground, and I remember this child was uh, bleeding, so I went over to her, and I'm like, what, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And then I remember that she was just bleeding and crying, and I immediately just picked her up, just out of instinct, not thinking at all. And I just brought her first aid, and I called her, her parents. Everything was okay. It reminded me that God is healer, that God is protector. And I believe that some of you here are just needing to go back and have a revelation that you are a child of God, that you are no longer a pauper, that you are a prince and princess of the kingdom of God, and that you can go back into royalty again. This is not something that you obtain any longer. This is something that you already have. This is your rightful identity of your royal inheritance. I... <laughs> Thank you. I'm not really used to uh, applause, so yeah, thank you. I feel really humble that you guys do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I feel like sometimes going up higher is really hard. Uh, sometimes when God calls you to something more, and there's always going to be more in the kingdom of God. I just want to illustrate this point. Uh, there's a story that I heard a while back, and it's called The Loneliest Whale in the World. It's like, the loneliest whale? That, that, is, that sounds so sad, Edwin. What is up with that? Well, supposedly these whales, they would travel together. Uh, they would go in packs. And then there's this uh, whales, they, they speak in different frequencies. Uh, they would speak at 40 frequency. And then I noticed that they would travel together. And this is a documentary. They would travel together because they all speak in the same hertz, which is 
40 hertz. Okay, so the, but there's this one whale, for whatever reason, they would go and speak in 52 hertz. So this one whale, no other species speaks in 52 hertz. Just one. But the others speak in 40. I think sometimes that God is calling us to go higher, to go to the 52, but some of us are staying at the 40 hertz, and that we need to come up higher and higher and higher, even though you might be feeling like you're in the wilderness by yourself. God is going to call you to a higher place, and I just want to declare and decree over you today that you can go up higher, that you can hear God in your job, that you can do the work of the Holy Spirit, and that he's constantly teaching you today. Amen. Let's go to uh, Matthew here. Uh, let's go to Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. Okay, look at your neighbor and say, I'm there. If you're wondering why preachers always say, hey, touch your neighbor this, say to your neighbor that, there's a reason for that. Uh, it's called emotion. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it really quickly. Emotion is this, energy in motion. So we create energy in the room so, because we want to have a different atmosphere. So if, if you're Apostle Michael saying, come on, say something. We're just trying to create energy in the room. We're trying to put more joy and worship in the room. So that's what it's all about. All right, so Matthew eleven twenty five. 25, it says this. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. I want to show you this study real quick. And can we just have that on the screen? And it's a study of about the divergent thinking versus convergent thinking. This is a study that I have shared with the ministers a couple of years ago. And the question was this, ministers, are you childlike? I have a question for you all too as well. Are you childlike? So here's a study, divergent versus uh, convergent thinking. And this is a study that you can see it on Netflix. It's by George Land. And so here we go. According to one study, at least 95% of children are divergent thinkers before the age of 12. What does it mean to be a divergent thinker? You have an imagination. You have creativity. You can think original thoughts. You're, not, you're, you're so different from everybody else. And the same study concluded that by age 12... 95% of us become convergent thinkers. Okay, convergent means this. You can guess it right now. You are unoriginal. You're conformists. You're just like everybody else. You're the 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but this scares me. That 95% that of us, by age 12, I'm 33. I'm thinking, am I a convergent thinker? Am I in this category? Did I lose my childlike thinking? And perhaps maybe for some of us in this room, your healing or your breakthrough is not coming because we have went to the convergent thinking. What if, what if there's some kind of unlocking mechanism? I just like to think and speculate that maybe but we should be divergent thinkers. We should think creatively. I mean, Jesus would spin in mud and he would put on someone's eyes. That's so gross, but so creative. I would, I would think about how Jesus would use a cross to, to die. He could have died another way. I, I just imagine that it's just so interesting that God would want us to be creative. Another person that I always think about is uh, Smith Wigglesworth. If you don't know who he is, uh, he's a general of the faith and one of my favorite kinds. And what he would do, he would heal people, but not in an ordinary way where Apostle Michael would use the two-finger method on you. He, <laughs> He would actually punch you and kick you. Nobody do that here, please. I hope you guys don't do that, punch and kick people, because uh, we don't want to get sued. But that's not the point here. That Smith Wigglesworth would be very creative in actually healing people. And I think some of us, we need to have that breakthrough, that we need to think creatively. So Because perhaps, maybe for some of you, that your breakthrough is not coming because of your lack of creativity. We need to become divergent thinkers once again. Okay, so we're having uh, this, this moment of just thinking about uh, creativity. And uh, there's this one story that I do want to share with you about. And there's this person that I hold dear to my heart. He's a charismatic man, and he's also a professor. He, I believe he has passed on. His name is Peter Wagner. 
And if you don't know, know him, uh, he's been very um, flagged with a lot of negative news about uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, the charismatic world is interesting because uh, some disagree with education, uh, but some do. And uh, Peter Wagner really advocated for education and that good proper theology would be set in order. But Peter Wagner did something interesting where he would actually uh, heal people. He's an educated man. He's a professor at Fuller. And so he's trying to teach people how to heal. And so he went to Dr. Cho, who had the largest church in the world in Korea. I'm proud that I'm Korean, so I can say that. <laughs> and so I, I remember there's this one story. So Peter would go, and he would pray for this one person who needed healing. And Peter's like, Praying and praying and praying, praying. Nothing is happening. God, how come it's not happening? He's not being healed. In Jesus' name, be healed. Have you guys ever had that moment where you're healing somebody and people are just looking around you? You don't know what to do? Well, that's what Peter did. He was praying for this person. So then he, so then he began to look back and he's like, what, why is the healing not happening? And so he began to think creatively. He began to imagine that the person was going to get healed. He was, he, was not, he was so focused on the right words. How many of you are like that, that when we pray, we're just trying to say the right words, right? We're trying to make ourselves look good in front of other people. We have proper vocabulary and language, but yet Peter wanted to be childlike. He wanted to know that he can be a divergent thinker. So he, remember Dr. Cho and said, all right, he said this, I'm going to imagine that this person is going to get healed. And so he does. And so he imagines that person getting healed, and suddenly this person gets healed. I think there's something to being a divergent thinker. I think there's something to using your creativity. I think there's something, something to being childlike once again. Because once we're childlike, maybe breakthrough can come. Maybe healing can come. Maybe the provision can come once again. It's all going back to your childlikeness once again. Oh. And then, um, so we want to just transition into Jesus here. So I I'm saying good stories here about different preachers and, and how we uh, just view ourselves as childlike. But I need to go to the Gospels because uh, we have to make this biblical. What did Jesus do to become like a child? There's not much reference upon Jesus and his childhood. We know a lot about his birth. Okay, how he was born, but there's not much unless you want to go to the Apocrypha and people would just make up stories like Joseph and Jesus playing basketball or, <laughs> or Jesus beating Joseph at games or doing the business, but there's not much there. And so let's just read on right here. Um, it says uh, Luke 2, 46, 48. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Some context to this, because this is kind of a verse out of random, is that uh, the parents were traveling uh, for the Passover. And if you remember this Passover event, it's an exodus. And in this Passover, uh, God would kill the firstborn. And then also the Israelites would escape from Egypt. And I love that story because I love when God instructs Moses to put the blood on the doorposts so God could pass by, the, which is called the Passover. There's something interesting about the blood that I would like to share with you. Maybe some of you today are struggling. Some of you today are struggling to get over the sin, even though God has already forgiven you. And he says this in his word that he does not remember it anymore. So if he forgot it. You should forget it too. Because he says, I will not remember thine anymore. And if you have still a struggle with that, even as I say, Edwin, that's great. It sounds really good. I know God's word. I know that I need to get over this, but I still see the sin in my life, and I want to give you 
a supernatural activation right now. And uh, you can take this with you. This is something I've been doing for years. As a creative kind of person, what I do is this. I get a brush in my hand. Can we all just do that right now? Can you get a brush in your hand? I know you may feel foolish, but we're going to activate that imagination, that sanctified imagination that you have, that childlike faith. Okay? There's a brush in your hand. Okay? Now, what you're going to do is put the sin in front of you, whatever that is. Don't tell anybody. Okay, we're gonna, this is a rhetorical question, all right? And then we're going to dip it in the Lord's blood, okay? All right, now we're going to pull it back out. Now, let's use our imagination, the brush. It's red, right? Now, the sin in front of you, what you do is this. You just brush it away. Do it with me. Brush it away, brush it away, brush it away. Brush it away. Even right now, some of you are sensing the peace of God with that, and you can stop once it's all red. You should only be seeing red at that point. His blood is upon you, that you have been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. The past is not there anymore. You are redeemed. There's redemption for you. Yeah. <laughs> so the parents, they come and they, 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 they notice that... Uh, Jesus, uh, they come to the temple, and um, they, they come to the temple because they notice after a few days after the Passover festival that uh, Jesus was not with them. It's like, where, where, was, where was my son? Uh, where did he go? Well, historically speaking, when they go to this Passover event, uh, there would be villages that would go. So it's like a huge group that would go. So they thought, oh, Jesus is in the front of the line or the back of the line. That's where usually the women and children are. Uh, but, uh, uh-oh, Jesus is gone. Where's my son? And so let's read on here. And it says, Luke 2.49, and it says this, And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now let's re- just, we're going to backtrack a little bit. So this temple, there's the brilliant minds there. Children are not welcome there. Uh, these are the people that are just so smart. Uh, they talk about nature. They talk about uh, theology. They talk about uh, the, the Torah, the, the laws, philosophy. These are the most brilliant minds. And Jesus is not actually supposed to be there. Remember, he's 12, which is the age of accountability. And so we see that Jesus is going there. And he's asking good questions. And sometimes in life, uh, the, the smartest things you can do is actually just ask good questions, not just have answers. Because wisdom says asking good questions could lead to more answers. And so Jesus is there. And he's saying something so interesting. He's saying this, oh, I must be at my father's house. The emphasis is not about being at church. I want to make that straight. You coming to church is not fulfilling calling. You coming to this place, Genesis, is not fulfilling destiny. It was specifically designed for Jesus in context that he was supposed to be there. He knew who he was at 12. And for some of you, maybe you don't even know what you were supposed to do at 12. I I just began to wonder, like, God, did I know what I was supposed to do at 12? Was I so busy adulting that I forgot? What, what's happening? Even right now, maybe for some of you that you are just thinking about, God, did you speak to me when I was 12? Was I supposed to be in my father's house? Was I supposed to continue my art? Oh, you gave me that business idea. I totally just knocked it off because I was so busy and caught up in this corporate life that I just wanted to make money. Isn't that a noble thing? And, you know, these are all good things, having a job and taking care of resources. I understand. I'm married now, so I understand what it's like to have responsibility. But there's something to following destiny and something to it to follow your calling and to become childlike once again. So I I do want to share this where, you know, Jesus is displaying this childlike heart and he fulfills his calling at 12, the age of accountability. And uh, there's this one story that has always ringed to my heart with this. And it, since this message is about protecting the childlike heart, I want to share a story with you about Oral Roberts. And uh, Oral Roberts is interesting. Can we just get his picture up on the screen, please? Uh, I just want to show you uh, this man because I do want to honor him. And uh, this man that you see on the screen is something, someone who I really love because I read his books and I watch his preaching style. He is a healing evangelist. 
and uh, he would heal so many people. I mean, we would see legs and arms and shoulders, uh, internal stuff, and he would heal all of them. And he was one of the few people that would uh, speak the, the seed faith uh, that we know today. And some people have actually uh, been misguided with the prosperity message. Uh, but he was actually very genuine in the seed faith and that God would provide. And Oral Roberts would have these stories where he would just say like, well, there was one time where I almost quit the ministry. And maybe for some of us, we feel like we want to quit sometimes because life is just so hard to do. And uh, there's this one story where Oral Roberts was on stage, right? And he's about to speak. And the, the Lord was just telling him, like, hey, I'm going to take care of you. And at this time, uh, there was a lot of poverty in the land. And Oral Roberts did not want to continue any longer. And he says, Lord, I'm not going to go out there. This is a tent revival meeting, by the way. I'm not going out. And how many of you guys feel like that? You know what to do, but you don't want to go out because maybe you're lacking in something. Maybe it'd be joy or provision or finances or something that you're just lacking in life. And so he says, no, I'm not going out. So his wife comes over and he says, hey, Oral, what's going on? You, you, have, a, you have a meeting to do. And uh, Oral Roberts says, I'm not going out. I'm going to stay right here. And he puts his head down like this and he's just feeling sorry for himself. So Oral Roberts' wife goes out. And uh, she just goes in front of the crowd, and uh, she just pleads and says, my husband is losing faith. And uh, I just, I, I almost tear about that, because this woman that we know uh, is not a speaker. And she's seeing, like, hundreds of people out there, and, and she just being vulnerable, d don't really know what to say. Maybe she's stumbling in words. My husband's losing faith. My husband is losing faith. Or Roberts have already seen a lot of healings at this time. And then uh, a lot of the crowds uh, responded, thankfully. Uh, one person would say, Oh, Roberts has done so much for my ministry. And uh, she would say, I'm going to pass the bucket. Who wants to put it in the hat? And then she would do it. Another person would raise up and say, I want to support him too. I love it when the body of Christ responds. I love it when they respond to when, when a person has a need because this is the Acts lifestyle. And so that's why Oral Roberts, he, he would notice so the, the buckets were passed and Oral Roberts got the provision and he says, I learned to trust God. I learned to follow him even though it may look dark, it may not look pleasing. It's a time that I trust him and I will, I will never quit again. So Oral Roberts has this experience. He's already at, been at the, the crossroads of when he should quit. And so he has a bigger task. How many of God just adds to a new level? Remember what we just talked about, okay? We're going to the 52 hertz. You're going to go to a higher realm. And so Oral Roberts gets his task, and God says this. Oh, you're going you're gonna to make a hospital. Oh, better yet, I want to combine medicine, and I want to combine prayer together. And uh, can we just get that picture up there and just to, as, a, as a visual? And this is the medical center. It's called City of Faith. And uh, this is something that Oral Roberts never done anymore. He's not a medical person. Uh, he, he's not a, a business person. He, he doesn't know anything about buildings. So he says, God, I'm going to go to my prayer closet. So he goes to his prayer closet, and he begins to pray. And how many know sometimes we just need to pray in the secret place? We just need to be alone with God and just pray and see what he's going to say. So he goes to the secret place, and he prays to the Lord. Okay, God, I'm going to pray that uh, this hospital comes to pass. So he does. And so he builds this building, and it's about halfway done. Just imagine that, halfway done. And he's almost there until the funding started to run out. Now he's devastated. Partners are calling him. There's news about him. Hey, there's this preacher in town that wants to build this building, but yet he can't finish it. What a heretic. He wants to combine medicine and prayer together. But how many of you know that God wants to do the impossible in life? Because when you see into the invisible, or Robert's words, you can do the impossible. So he was seeing into the invisible, but yet again, he's lacking in faith. He's lacking in childlikeness. He's lacking creativity. He's lacking imagination. He does not know how this comes to pass. I think sometimes in our lives that we have 
no breakthrough because we just don't know how God's going to come through instead of opening up the channel that God will come through for us. So Oral Roberts is like in that state. He can't, he can't imagine what's going to happen. So he's thinking, I, I, I don't know. I give up again. And, at, and this is the human heart that we give up and give up and give up. But God is going to come through again. He's going to come through again. He's going to come through again. And he's going to come through again. And that's the good gospel news because he is Savior. That is one of his names. He's not just healer. He's just not protector. He's not provider. He's also Savior. And he will save you even during these times. So, old Robert's feeling sorry. He goes to his car. He's looking at this building. And he's thinking, ah, it's not being built. What should I do? And uh, he has this encounter. And uh, sometimes we just need an encounter from the Lord just to continue our ministry. Who wants an encounter today? Uh, the counter is this, that Oral Roberts began to uh, just have this vision. And this vision became very strong where uh, Jesus was this very, very tall, big person. He was taller than that building. And then he would pick up the building. And then he told Oral Roberts, I'm going to help you. Don't worry. I, I will bless you. Your partners are going to come through for you. Because he had partners. He had a big ministry at this time. So don't worry. I'm going to help you out. And he again had this encounter. And he trusted God. And after that, he built the building. City of faith. It has come to pass. And sometimes we just need an encounter to go forward with our ministry. And I, I just feel like that Oral Roberts in the story that he just almost lost his, uh, his childlike heart. Some of you have so much experience. You, you, you know what it's like to be healed. You know how, how it's like to heal others. You have seen breakthrough come. Some of you got filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're like, wow, that's the biggest miracle of all time. I can't believe that just happened to me. But yet, a crisis hits, and you don't want to go forward anymore. You want to quit again. And sometimes in those moments, we do need more encounters with the Lord because that is the only way that we can continue, that when we dive into his word, that he would have his presence come upon us and that the, the dove would start resting upon us and that we can move forward in him because it's not by our works, it's by his works as what he has done but not what we has done and we can nail everything to the cross right now all the problems of the world all the all the pain and suffering that we have uh, done and we can just put it on the cross because jesus is savior Amen. so i want to pray for you all uh, about this protecting this childlike heart and this is the part one of the series right now and uh, i would like to just invite you to the front um, if you if you felt like you were thinking about when you were a child and you know I remember my dad uh, I was I was drawing and I drew this red sun and my dad was like why are you drawing a red sun it's yellow and I said no it's red <laughs> and uh, it's funny because I I was making uh, these glass uh, ornaments with my wife and I actually drew like a red circle as I got older. It was always in me to have a red circle, so don't get mad at me. And so maybe you're like that, like me, like you had this imagination when you were a kid, but somewhere along the way you have lost it. And uh, maybe you were thinking about that story I just shared with Jesus and how you know he was 12 years old. He was at the temple. And uh, you're thinking, like, what, did I, what happened to me when I was 12? Uh, God, I, 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 I came so far off the edge. I, I went way over there. I was supposed to be here. I resonate with that story because I, I was supposed to be at your house. I was called to ministry, but I stopped doing it. And maybe you feel like you are meant to go higher. You don't want to be in this same place anymore. And maybe for some of you, you feel like you're just so uncomfortable right now. Like, God, this, this feeling I'm getting right now, this overwhelming peace, but yet so uncomfortable at the same time because I, I don't know what to expect from you. I don't know how to go further. I am scared, but God, I do want to go further with you in the kingdom. I do want this encounter that he is talking about. <laughs>